Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Bitcoin Developers. I am your host, Ono Ocus. Um, maybe we've got another exciting episode for you. Um, we've had a little break actually the last few weeks because uh, we've still got, still got music. <laughs> um, we've, we've had a little break the last last two weeks um, because uh, we've been attending a few conferences actually. So uh, one of those was um, the Bitcoin uh, Lightning Hack Day by Fumo. Um, let me share my screen actually and. Uh, give you guys a little a look at what that is um so yeah this was a this was a hack day in in istanbul on the 25th and 27th of february um just before like the the madness happened in in ukraine i guess so um from what i hear it was a super successful event and um some really good projects came out of this so it's definitely a, a conference you should keep in mind for for next year for if you're a builder and you want to kind of like get together with like-minded people who are also building on on lightning and trying to innovate in that area um and, and get together and do that and then the other one was advancing bitcoin as well which was held here in in london last week um is is really cool for me i got to meet quite a lot of people who i'd built relationships with over this last uh two years um during during the pandemic and actually get to meet them in, in person and stuff so that was uh fantastic so um if you are yeah again if you're if you're a builder and, and, and you want to um be around some like-minded people and uh discuss ideas and do workshops that kind of thing advancing bitcoin is definitely one to look out for and then um going forward next month we have um, bitcoin miami which is i guess one of the biggest uh Bitcoin conferences we have and uh, thankfully the organizers have decided to set set an, an open source stage which will host a, a lot of technical talks as well and if you happen to be an open source yeah Miami let's let's go um if you if you happen to be an open source uh, com contributor to um, a Bitcoin project they're actually giving out free tickets so I'm not sure if it's too late to apply um I think you can still apply so if, if you know if you if you feel so in feel so inclined to do so i definitely encourage you to to come and join us in uh, join us in miami here's a list of yeah some of the projects i guess that um people have contributed to and uh and contributors from those projects are receiving tickets so that's really that's really awesome initiative from from the bitcoin conference i think matt adele might be spearheading a lot of this stuff so shout out to him for for helping us get that done um so let me stop sharing my screen and uh, we can now introduce our, our guest. So I've got my, my friend Steve uh, with me here today. Um, we're gonna he's gonna teach us some stuff related to the to the Bitcoin Dev Kit. But um, yeah, how you doing, Steve? Great, happy to be here. This is exciting to uh, be live with everybody talking BDK CLI. Yeah, awesome. So we've um yeah we've done a few um, BDK related. Uh, live streams in the past we've had raj on we've had alakos on uh we've had thunder biscuit on as well um and all sharing various um components within bdk um and today we're going to look at the cli so we'll talk a little bit about that in in a little bit but um what i do with my guests i always want to just like find out a little bit about their story and like how they get got into bitcoin and why they're interested in in um and building on bitcoin so do, do you mind sharing a little bit of that yeah, with us. Sure. Um, so, I mean, my, my Bitcoin story is probably similar to a lot of Bitcoin people, you know, developers in general. So I was an enterprise software developer, um, primarily working on a uh, very corporate uh, payroll and accounting software. Um, as part of my day job, that meant looking at uh, websites for things like uh, news to distract myself. And I ran across, I ran across a, a post basically on Slashdot about uh, Bitcoin. And that's kind of where the journey began. And I didn't do much with it at first, but, you know, over the years I got more and more interested. And at, at one point I decided I should, you know, I should try to make a Bitcoin based application. So me and my brother started working on a little Bitcoin project and we wanted it to be on mobile primarily. It was going to be sort of like a over the counter trading app um, with a, one of the key components was a multi-sig wallet. Um, so at the time there wasn't much wallet support for especially for mobile 
Um, and you know, we had Android phones, but we also wanted it to work on iOS phones. Um, and there was really nothing we could use. Um, so we went down this whole project with Android and then got completely stuck on the iOS side. Um, and that's when uh, I started looking at Rust and Rust Bitcoin. Um, it's an amazing set of primitives, but it's not a full wallet. So I started working on making a library to help make wallets easier. Um, there was another Bitcoin wallet project um, a, 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 a man by the name of Thomas Bloomer was working on. Um, sadly, um, he was unable to continue the project. He passed away and was sick. Um, so I started sort of taking what he started and trying to build build on that. Um, and in parallel with this effort, I was on this was just you know a few years ago. Um, in parallel, um, there was another person making a wallet, um, doing almost a, a very similar project. Um, Alakos, who's been on this on this show. Um, and you know, through the through the help of Square uh, uh, Square Crypto at the time, now now Spiral, uh, Steve Lee helped get me and Alakos together, and uh, I came to the conclusion that what Alakos had started was much better than what I had started. Um, he was much further along and a much better coder, to be honest, with Rust, and I was fairly new to Rust. So we just joined forces and started the Bitcoin Dev Kit project. Um, he also had some other developers that he had worked with on his on his side that um, you know that had built different parts that had worked with him on it. Um, so yeah. So anyway, um, I had, at that point um, was also given a grant by um, Spiral to work on and help support and maintain and develop BDK. And um, two years later, that's where I am today. Still very excited about BDK and building mobile wallets. Um, so. That's um, yeah. That's what I'm doing. Awesome. So it, it was literally very much uh, you trying to solve your own your own problems yeah, and exactly identifying like that. that. Like yeah. yeah, I wanted to build a Bitcoin app, and there mm -hmm. I could find a library that did what what I needed, which was multi, mm -hmm. you know, easy multi sig. There were there were some Java ones out there, like Bitcoin J has been around a long time, mm -hmm. but it didn't support Segwit at the time even, and it didn't support descriptors. Um, is something that BDK is very strong on is descriptors, which allows you to make very complicated signing conditions for your mm -hmm. wallet for like multiple participants, which we'll go through today. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, so that was that was the impetus. And, and you know, now the the library is sort of taken over, and I'm I'm more interested in helping other people write applications. So that's my new goal is to uh, yeah. all those cool applications I had in my head. I want to encourage other people to make them for me using BDK. Awesome, awesome. And so. Um... Yeah, we'll talk about BDK again in, in a second. But what is the what is the biggest one or two whys for you when it comes to building on Bitcoin for Bitcoin with Bitcoin? Yeah, I think it's making it. I mean, it's 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 complicated. I I I always think of you know there's a lot of comparisons between Bitcoin and the internet, and the sad thing is a lot of aspects of the internet became so hard that you have to use a hosted service. You know, like email. If anybody's tried to ever set up an email server, it's next to impossible. Mm -hmm. um, with libraries and systems like BDK and Lightning, it, it, the, they should be easy enough to um, to be self custodial. Like you shouldn't have to go to a, a service provider to be able to use them and set them up. Um, so that's you know kind of one of the goals I think for BDK is to make self self custody Bitcoin. Um, using the features of the library to make it as powerful as a hosted service, as easy to use and as powerful. So you shouldn't have to give up anything to have a self-custodial Bitcoin application wallet. Um, and I say application or wallet because I think there's a lot of things you can do once you have a Bitcoin wallet that's not just sending and receiving Bitcoin. So. Yeah, that makes total sense. So, um, we, yeah, so we have had some people previously on that have been part of the project. Um, do you want to give us a, your kind of a, a spiel for Bitcoin with Bitcoin DevKit and how you kind of see it as obviously being one of the, the, the lead maintainers or co-founders or however you want to term it? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So the I mean, the core library that Alocos created, it was written called Magical Bitcoin. That that's like all the basics you need to make a wallet. So it's everything from, you know, you, you know, setting up the wallet, syncing it to a blockchain. Um, different kinds of blockchains, different kinds of, um, um, you know, signing under different conditions using this descriptor setup. Um, 
uh, but just in Rust, like it was just a Rust library. So where, you know, around that core library, there are, you know, we're, we're starting to build these language bindings, which allows you to basically use the Rust Bitcoin library using a different language like Java. My background has primarily been in Java as an enterprise okay. developer. So that was my kind of my, my comfort zone originally, although now I, I feel pretty comfortable with Rust too. I, I'm, mm -hmm. I, I prefer it over Java, but, but anyway, I still mm -hmm. see value in, in providing a language like Java and also um, we're now supporting Swift so that it works on iOS. Um, so there's sort of this, like I said, the core BDK library in Rust, and then there's sort of these projects around it. Um, one of them being the language bindings, the other one being the CLI, which we're going to talk about today. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the CLI having multiple purposes, one for training, like we're doing now, one mm -hmm. for um, testing. Like if we want to do some manual testing on the library, it's convenient to have a little CLI tool to do that with. Um, okay. And then just, you know, general experimentation for anybody who wants to do it. And then there's even a, we, we have a, one, one of the uh, new contributors to BDK is, Work, who works for a bank is actually trying to build a, an application for his bank using the CLI. So um, wow. it, it could actually see some real world use. Although everything we're going to do today is test net. So no money involved. Okay. okay. Awesome. Um, all right. So uh, I guess as well, if, if people want to follow you, um, I see you're on Twitter. Is that a good place to like follow you and yeah. kind of see? That's a way to follow me. I, I put it on my little handle here, I think. So at not mandatory. Okay. Awesome. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's try and um, set the scene a little bit for for the viewers about what we're going to try and achieve today. Um, do you want to kind of like talk us through like what the journey might look like for for us kind of learning using the CLI? Like, what are we going to try and try and achieve today? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, as I was saying, one of the things that BDK is very strong with is you can create what are called descriptor wallets, which means that the spending conditions for your wallet are defined by this, you know, string called a descriptor. Um, and one of the things you can define in that descriptor is potentially multiple party signing, like a two of three or a three of four. Um, but you can do other conditions, things like a time lock. You can say these, this bit of Bitcoin can only be si can only be spent if it's two blocks old or three blocks old or a month old or something. This, you know. Mm -hmm. How you use this is sort of up to you know there could be some you know depending on your like you have some company you might have some policies that you want to encode into this descriptor so what we're going to do today is we're going to give a so the a lot of wallets work as either two of two or two of three mm -hmm. That's a pretty common scenario if you go to like for instance unchained capital uses a two of three the green wallet uses a two of two um those are traditional kind of non-custodial setups we're going to do sort of a non-traditional setup here which is where it'll be a a three out of four things have to happen. And only three of those things are signatures. Um, one of them can be a, uh, can just be a time lock, which means the, the coins you're spending are more than we're going to, in this case, we'll do two blocks. So you can either right. sign with three signatures or two signatures plus weighted weights and delay time. Um, so we'll just be demonstrating that from the CLI using, um, I guess, to set up some of the, some of the setup is we're just going to be using BDK on the command line with a Electrum server. Our mm -hmm. CLI defaults to the um, the block stream as an Electrum server testnet. So we'll just uh, we'll use that. Okay. okay. And pre and previous to something like you know this tool and just BDK more generally, like how, what was it like trying to do slightly more complex spending policies and um, yeah, it was yeah very more, more more advanced kind of stuff. It basically before something like descriptors in general like um core the core the core wallet bitcoin core supports descriptors but only only recently like only within the mm -hmm. last week. so it's quite new it didn't exist in core um there were some i think some python libraries that might have supported it but um it, it generally wasn't available it wasn't easy to do wasn't available um sure. and it definitely was not available in a cross-platform way um you know doing it on a command line or doing it on you know, like a web page or something wasn't possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, that makes sense. Yeah, um, I got a comment saying that this is a cool hoodie. Yeah, this is a 2020 edition of um, <laughs> Advancing Bitcoin um, swag that I got for volunteering at the conference. So it's limited edition, um, but I might be willing to sell it for some sats if, if people want to 
put some bids in the chat there. Um, okay, so we have a question regarding Swift binaries. Um, yeah. Can it be added to Swift Package Manager so that it's available easily? It will make it easy to use in iOS apps. Yes, it actually should be available. You should be able to bring it in. Um, if you mean Xcode, I, th I think uh, that's what you mean. It, it is packaged for Xcode, so you can go ahead, bring up Xcode. You just have to point to our GitHub repository, which is BDK-Swift, and then it's going to give you a dropdown of all the uh, tagged versions, and you just pick one, and it's going to bring it right into your um, into your Swift project. And it's already got binaries for um, iOS um, and Mac OS, both for the Intel and for the M1 chip, which was a bit of a hassle, but it works. <laughs> we tested it recently. Uh, now, keep in mind the, the language bindings, um, which we're not going to talk about today, but we should do, I know that uh, Thunder Biscuit did one on the Android side. At some point, we mm -hmm. should do it on the Swift side, but um, mm -hmm. it's, it's still only a subset of the functionality that we have. Even, even the command line has more functionality right now than the um you know than the language binding ones but that's one that's a, a big priority for me is to to kind of build that up so that we have feature parity between all of the languages that bdk supports okay so, and the good. command line and keeping the command line up to date too with with everything bdk can do fantastic um we've got our first bid of twenty thousand sats so let's see uh <laughs> where we can get to by the end of the stream <laughs> um all right cool i think that's a, a good and sufficient amount of uh, context and background. So um, do you feel good to kind of dive in and, and uh, sh sure. show, show off the CLI? Okay, cool. Let me move a few things around here so I can get set up. Yeah, and when you're getting that set up, I can just mention that we've, we've yeah. pre-canned some of this command line stuff. Um, and I think, um, should I share it in the stream, the, uh, the link to the blog post? Uh, yes, you can do, why not? That, does, that makes sense to me. Um, so just, my... We're going to loosely follow. Um, how to do that. Uh, uh, or I can show it here. I've got it here. One second. Okay. Um, I'm not sure where to where to type it. For oh no, it's, Stephen's got us. Thanks, Stephen. Um, okay. Yeah. So the, this is just we're going to. This is a bit old, using a bit older version of uh, BDK CLI, but it's generally correct. I mean, it generally works. Um, we're just going to do a little more command line and a little less um, popping over to the web pages. Okay, cool. So if I share this screen, okay, cool. So yeah, since we're working from the CLI, I've just um, gone and opened up my item terminal here, and yeah, I think I'm ready to ready to okay. learn about what the CLI is about. So, so the first step would be installing the BDK CLI. Um, and I think you've you've already done that, Connor, or should we? Uh, no, I haven't actually. So right. we can um, go ahead and we'll do that. The first command, I think, yeah. So um, that cargo install command that's in the first. Okay, so car cargo is, um, I guess, just just for people that don't know, what is car cargo is the is the right. package manager for the Rust toolchain, yeah. Right, that's right. So that's true. If you don't have the Rust toolchain installed, you do have to go back and install that. Um, uh, Thunder Biscuit has a video series that's linked on this channel, I believe. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah I'll, I'll link it is is after the um, after this this uh, stream as well. Um, that's uh, that isn't isn't maybe it's not necessarily a prerequisite to do this, but it just um, takes you through like some of the installation process, the Rust toolchain stuff, um, yeah. and some other stuff like creating a wallet and sending and receiving and stuff like that as well. I think you at least need the first video to just install the Rust tool. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. Then, and then you can follow along from there. Um, so, all right, cool. So uh, we're going to use we're going to do Cloud yeah, Code Package yeah, Manager. Yeah, CLI, uh, CLI. Yeah. I think oh, that's CLI. Cool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. And then the next thing we're going to type here is we're going to say dash dash features, which is telling us you're actually building a version of this tool and installing it. So we have to say which okay. of the Rust features we want, and then um, the ones I I. Here just be REPL, so R E P L, and yeah. then comma Electrum, and then common uh, comma compiler. So um, those are the three that were the three main features we're going to use. And um, just as a little explanatory, uh, REPL means you can do uh, a. Um, uh, I forgot what REPL means. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I always forget what it means as well. But uh, uh, let's see, what does it mean? We got Google here. We don't have to. I know. Um, I know. Away. It was in his video today. And I just watched it today. <laughs> uh, 
Um, what does it stand for again? It's uh, let me see. I'm doing my Google. Oh, read, oh, read, 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 yeah, yeah, read so about yeah, prelude. Yeah, right. Yeah. So it's a yeah. And then Electrum is the name. So with BDK, you can talk to multiple. You can talk to the Bitcoin blockchain in multiple protocols. We're going to mm -hmm. be using the Electrum protocol. We also support others such as RPC, directly talking to a full node. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a sort of a limited version of um, BIP 157, 158, which is like a light client protocol. Um, okay. We support Explora also, but we're just going to stick with this one for now. Okay, that right. sounds good. We're compiling all these little pieces that are going to get built into the CLI tool. Okay, uh, and what, what is it used by default? Is it election by... By default for the so I think it's interesting too. You can actually do it without any blockchain. So say you just uh, wanted to generate new addresses, like you might have like a donation website or something, and you don't actually want to um, put any private keys or anything. You just want it to, yeah. or even go to the blockchain, just continuously generate addresses. You can actually do it. You can do it in that sort of um, offline mode. So okay. in that case, you just don't put any, um, basically any features in that case. Okay. Cool. Have, you can still access parts of the wallet that don't need the blockchain, which is primarily generating new addresses, but um, you know, that's one of the modes we support. Okay, that makes sense. Um, oh, yeah, and there is a link to the Rust tool chain um, that Steve has posted here, so if anyone oh, yeah. wants to use that. Okay, so what happens if you don't specify the features flag? So if you don't specify the features, you're going to get the default features, and the default features don't include the blockchain. Um, and they also want to include that compiler feature. Um, we'll be as we go f down. I'll explain what the compiler feature does. But it's it's a it's a nice easy way to create a descriptor. It helps us create our descriptor. So yeah, you basically don't get any of those goodies. It'll just do very basic things like create new addresses from your descriptor. Okay. All right. I think we're we're almost there. Because I'm streaming, it's a bit slower than it usually would be, but yeah, some of it depends on what's cached. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, looks like we're all good, good there. Yeah. So I'll clear my screen. Okay, so we have, um, it looks like we have it installed. Is there a way for me to just to confirm that? Yep. So you can verify it's installed just by typing bdk dash cli space dash dash help. Okay, cool. So we're on uh, version 0 0.4.0. Right. Um, it's saying here there's some top level option command mode. So usage, you just type BDK CLI mm -hmm. options and it's got some sub commands. It's got some flags. So we've just used the help flag there. And you can also check the version, print the version. Options include network. So this is the big network. Yeah. Uh, Defaulting the testnet. Yeah. Yeah. And then here are some of our yeah, sub commands as well. Okay. Yep. So we're going to be using the commands we'll be using are the wallet command and the key mm -hmm. command and the compile command. Um, okay, awesome. As we go through each one of those, I can explain. Actually, yeah, we're, even though I, I included REPL, we're not going to use it for this example. But Okay. No problem. Cool. All right. Okay. So. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is um, generate some keys. So mm -hmm. usually if you were doing something really secure, you wouldn't want to generate your keys on your computer, but this is just for mm -hmm. testing. So we're going to use okay. the bdk-cli space key space generate command. Space and you can copy that from the file. It's um, And then we're going to pipe it to t. This key mm -hmm. command, and then we're going to put it into a file called alice-key.json. Um, the way the yeah. replica tool, or the way the uh, the CLI tool works, right? So all the T, just for anybody's curious, all the T thing does is it it sends it to the it sends this data to the screen, and it also puts it into a file, and because we're going to use this. Oh, thing. okay. So that's the only difference. So you should have a file there called Alice. Yep. Okay. Go. Cool. And then um, you can see that if you were making a wallet, like a wallet, a mobile wallet or something, and you were using this code to create the keys, this is your, mm -hmm. backup, you know, your backup words. Um, and you can configure how many words. I think it's defaulting here to 24, but you could do 12 if you wanted. 
Um, okay. You see that the main thing we want to get out of this file is the expriv, because this mm -hmm. is what you need for doing signing. Um, so now, okay, let's okay. Do, so we can just do this command two more times. You can hit the um, F row if you want and just change Alice to Bob and then run it again for Carol. One for Bob and one for Carol. Yeah. That's it. Okay, so now we have three keys. Um, you can imagine, you know, these are three individual people. They have these keys on their own hardware wallets or their own mobile wallets, whatever they're doing. Um, and I guess there's another way to do this. Teams? Oh no! I think uh, are they just saying that is the, um, the the flow of how T works? So it creates a file for you and then it prints it out to the console, basically. Right. I think that's what they're saying. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Cool. Okay. So now we go to the next step. So now what we're going to do is we're going to set some environment variables on our shell, and we're going to do that by reading in these files. Um, you can you're going to type export. You can actually maybe copy this from the file. Yeah, from okay. Harry. Um, yeah. Let's have a look here. So we want something like. Okay, so what are we doing here? So we're creating a. Yeah. So we're going to do is we're going to ex yeah export. So we're going to basically create a new variable called Alice underscore expriv. Mm -hmm. This is our Alice's uh, private key, and we're going to get that by um, extract. We're going to basically um, cat. I think it stands for catalog, but it's basically just. Um, it's sending the output of this file to a pipe, which is the little bar, and then mm -hmm. JPU will parse the JSON contents, and it's mm -hmm. going to pull out the element called expriv, and yep. it'll just put that value into this variable. So we'll do that for. We'll also do that for Alice, Bob, and Carol. So you can. Uh, I can probably copy these yeah, again. Can be, a quick, be a bit okay. easier. So okay, cool. Um, and Carol as well. Mm -hmm. And once we get all these variables set up, we can just we'll just be reusing them. Okay. Cool. So awesome. um, but now we have we have three private keys. Um, mm -hmm. What we're going to do now is we're going to create a public key derived from those private keys. This is something that's that's an optional feature of BDK, where it can take from a private key. Um, it can take like a standard path. In this case, we're doing a um, what's it called the um, BIP eighty four which is in a higher in a hierarchical deterministic wallet mm -hmm. you have this sort of path on where to generate your keys in this case it's it starts with 84 with that little tick mark meaning it's a hardened path and then okay. the one is a hardened path after that um, and then the zero hardened path and then zero the last bit is telling us that it's uh, it's generally used for the um, they call external addresses so wallets you're going to give to other people uh, addresses okay to other people. So if you want to copy that first command, we can see how it is for Alice. So uh, this is going to give us a public key. So go ahead and um, export that or run that export command. Now, I think I put in the sheet. Um, if you go ahead and do an echo, there's an echo command there after uh, yeah. the next line. Um, so this, okay. this is going to look a little different than what we saw for the private keys. For the private mm -hmm. keys, what we saw was we saw just a T priv, TPRV, and mm -hmm. then we saw the path, this 84 path, mm -hmm. uh, and then we would put the 84 path. Basically, the way to think about it is this first this first little bit, it's A9701B05. That's what they call the fingerprint to the master key. And then from that uh, key, we're deriving a new public key at a certain location in the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. um, and then that gives us that gives us our, our XPUB. I mean, so I is the way to think about it is like it's literally like a tree structure. So mm -hmm. um, the the last this this last zero represents like all of the um, I guess child addresses that you would actually it's, use. It, it's one step beyond that. So that oh, okay. it, see, there's a little star at the end. It's kind of wrapped around onto the next line. But um, oh, here, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. So that is that's actually the that's at the point that's the point where it's deriving additional addresses. Right, got you. So, okay, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. So actually, I found a little problem, but that's okay. This it's, this still works. Yeah. Um, okay. okay. So let's go ahead and run those other commands for Bob and Carol. Okay. Yeah, so we can do the same for. Let me make this a little bit smaller. Um, 
Okay, so one for an X pub for Bob and an X pub for. Um, well, I guess let's um, let's just check that for Bob as well. So if we echo his X pub, yep. we get a similar. Yeah, yeah, the thing that I was mentioning that it, it's not mm -hmm. standard here is see that slash is zero at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, that actually should have been at the end. So it should have been slash zero slash star, but that's okay. This will work. This will work fine. It's just a little non standard. Okay. Um, okay. And last one is for Carol as well. Mm -hmm. um, and let's print her X pub as well. Right. Right. So okay. now we have basically a public and a private key for both, uh, for all three of our folks. Um, and we're going to use those okay. when we create our descriptor. Those are sort of the, the pieces we need. Um, okay, so and we've got and we've got all of those available in just uh, bash variables. So yeah, exactly. Cool. Just we can we okay. can put them as variables in in some new string. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, sounds good. Yeah. So the next thing we're going to do. So now we've basically got our keys. The next thing we need to do is create our descriptor. So this is where where things get a little interesting because we have to basically define what's called a policy, a a descriptor policy. And there's a a really great Chain Code Labs. Um, podcast on this topic with the um, one of the creators of these descriptor policies, um, okay. Peter Will, I believe. And um, so anyway, I won't go into exactly what they do now. But mm -hmm. if you if you look at the next line, um, we're going to yeah. export a descriptor for Alice. Actually, maybe we want to just paste in this test policy. Well, wait, just before we do that, actually, I think the, the, the BDK website's got a nice like uh, table yeah. that shows right. some of let me let, yeah let me show that actually to the people just in case there's anyone that's not seen that um oh share let's share this window here uh okay so i'll share this one and then i think if we go to descriptors yeah, yeah. this might give people like a bit of a nice or clear indication of what we're actually talking about here yeah so it's um yeah so the, the high level idea is that instead of writing scripts by hand, you can use this sort of well um, defined set of primitive pieces and compose them together in order to create a descriptor, which can then be converted directly. It maps one to one in both directions from you can mm -hmm. go from a I'm sorry, sorry, different things. Um, there's mini script and they have descriptors. So in this case, we're actually putting Miniscript into our descriptor. Um, and mm -hmm. that Miniscript will create a Bitcoin script as we create transactions. So it's just a little, I guess the way to think about it, it's a little, it's a it's a better way, it's a, it's a simpler way to define the Bitcoin scripts that you want your wallet to work on. Okay. And, and they just like they just look like functions, really, don't they? They just like look like gen yeah, general yeah, functions yeah. that you're used to, you know, using as a as a developer or a program or whatever. Very much um, like that. Some of the yeah. some of the pieces can only be used in certain places, like these. Mm -hmm. WSH means a witness script hash. Mm -hmm. um, that's mm -hmm. kind of top level script type. Um, yeah, always used here. But then some of these pieces in the middle are yeah, like like you said, sort of like functions. This multi two means. Mm -hmm a multi-signature you need two out of the list given and that's the kind of script we're going to use here okay yeah. that sounds good all right let me swap back over now again um back to the terminal and get this up all right cool so we're gonna write a, a we're gonna actually do what we're gonna do something a little tricky here is we're gonna take mm. so there's also sort of another so we're actually gonna uh, use this thing called a policy which is sort of like a descriptor. Um, okay. It's, um, I guess you can just go ahead and put in that first export line okay. plus descriptor, and then we can look okay. at it and see what's in it. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I'll paste this in and then we can walk through it, okay. Yeah. So we're gonna basically, so our policy is this thresh, three, um, a public key, um, another public key, and a third public key, mm -hmm. or this thing that says older two. So what this is saying is our policy is that um, you must satisfy a threshold of these conditions. And the, there's four conditions that need to be satisfied, that can be satisfied, and you need to satisfy three of them. So you either can get a signature from Alice, a signature from Bob, and a signature from mm -hmm. Carol, 
or you can get a signature from two of those plus the block is older plus the the thing you're spending is older than two blocks for this test would be two blocks. Oh, okay interesting okay so is threat so can you um define we, as many parameters as you wanted here technically yeah, like, so yeah and that's a good question because there's that's another thing that miniscript gives you um that i did mention was that if if you say you said 30 there instead of three mm -hmm. yeah and you gave it you know 30 different things here that's mm -hmm. probably gonna make a script that's too big to be valid on the bitcoin network um right. too big or there's some certain sort of standardness rules that bitcoin core requires you follow and oh, this yeah. this com this step will enforce all that it'll give us an error message if we try to make an invalid spending thing basically the thing that can't be spent basically got you um, okay that it makes a lot of sense those, those sort of checks too so you can go ahead and hit return on that one and then we'll so so what this is just, actually, and then just just uh, one more question yeah. sorry steve um and then so this this pk is um that's a descriptor in it in yes, itself. this is actually so I guess I complicated this maybe a little more than I should have. This is mm -hmm. so what we're going to be we're going to be going from this policy, this threshold policy, and it's going to compile it into a descriptor. Ah, uh, 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 got you, got you. Yeah. Descriptor, because what it's mm -hmm. going to do is it's going to do a couple things. It's actually reforming, reformatting this thing called Miniscript. So got this you. is a little confusing, and honestly, I'm still kind of getting my head around it. You can go yeah. from threshold into a Miniscript. Um, statement and then use that in a descriptor so it's a descriptor ah. that includes mini script um if you if you do an echo i think i put an echo in the sheet here yeah you can um, echo no, no, maybe i didn't but um so we, yeah, we can try and do it anyway but uh so if yeah. i echo alice descriptor right right dollar yeah uh, and then descriptor. so you can see it looks a little bit like it but it, it's a little different too i guess it Mainly, it added the WSH. That's the default for BDK. Mm -hmm. It defaults mm -hmm. WSH when it's doing this compile. Um, and then uh, it, okay. it added a couple of other little bits in here. It's kind of hard to find, but um, yeah. you can see the PK is the same. And then we substituted in the variable for Alice's private key. Um, you can see oh, that yeah. I added this 84100 star onto mm -hmm. that private key. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess I should explain here too that so Alice is descriptor has her private key but then the public key of the other two people involved so bob i'm using the public key and carol i'm using their public key so the reason i have to do that is for alice to be able to make a signature she needs to have her private key as part of the descriptor string that's why each one will have a descriptor um okay that makes sense and, then, and actually yeah and then if you want to do the other two uh, the mm -hmm. other things you people might be confused by when they look at these is um there's a, a little hash symbol and then a, some characters. Um, this whole descriptor language includes things like, it includes sort of a, a checksum to make sure you didn't enter things wrong. Um, so that's all part of this whole descriptor standard too. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, BDK outputs that stuff too. Yeah, the checksum. Um, okay, cool. So now, so now we have, we have three, three, descriptors. Yeah. three descriptors, okay. Cool. Okay, so now what we're ready to do is um, uh, this is a kind of our first test to make sure we did it right. Um, mm -hmm. First thing I would say is let's just make sure there's an I put an RM command there, mm -hmm. and you should probably run that. It's um, so it's it, removing a dot BDK dot Bitcoin. Is this just like um, yeah. where it's storing like logs or metadata? Yeah, and, basically, if you've ever if you've created any BDK wallets before, that's where it caches right. the data. So it doesn't store any of your keys. In your okay. in this in this directory, it only stores like cached block data and cached transaction data. Uh, okay. But it's always just good to start fresh if you're doing a bunch of testing because you don't want to have any anything old in there. It might okay, mess got you. Up. Yeah. So um, so now what we can do is we can start using the CLI with these variables we created. The only one we're okay. going to so the first one we're going to use is the BDK dash CLI, <laughs> and then yeah, I'll um, type I'll type this one out. I'll type this one then, out. Yep. Wallet um, and then dash D. I'm sorry, dash W um, yeah. and then Alice. So W Alice means that's in the lowercase uh, for my example. Um, so this is we're oh, basically it's like the wallet name, is it? Or wallet name. And the reason we're doing this is because we're, you know, it's going to store all the data in this BDK uh, dash Bitcoin folder. And we don't want to, oh, okay. it, it'll get, 
It'll give you an error message, actually, if you try to use two different descriptors for the same data. Got you. So we avoid okay. that using that two w Alice. And then it's that that D and the um, dollar Alice descriptor. And then um, at the end of that, you're going to um, type the command. So we're basically saying here is we've got the wallet name, the descriptor, and now we can do any wallet subcommand. So the wallet subcommand we're going to use is get underscore address. New address? New address. Yeah, yeah. So new address. Okay. And there we go. Okay. Nice. So this has generated a testnet address for us to receive some testnet coins, yeah? That's right. Testnet segwit address. So, awesome. um, so now what we can do is we can do the same command for um, Bob. Oh, uh, yeah, for um, for Bob and for Carol. Carol, okay. So and, and we'll notice something interesting when we do this. Yeah, uh, Bob, Bob descriptor. Uh, okay, so it's gener Anybody in the chat want to mention what what's interesting about this? Yeah, I was going to say it, but maybe okay. someone in the chat might. And I'll do Carol while. Sure. What if we generate more than one address for any of them? And we see Carol. So Connor, what did you what did you find? What did you find interesting here? All the addresses are the same. Exactly, they're all the same. That's what's interesting is they're all using a combination of public and private keys. So. Bob only has a private key for himself and then two publics. And the same with Carol. She only has her private key and two public keys. Mm -hmm. This is a way that people with different wallets can collaborate. And they're always going to get the same addresses generated because mm -hmm. the descriptors will always generate the same outputs. Um, it actually uses, when it creates the, the addresses, it's actually hashing in this address the um, mm -hmm. public keys. So it always kind of uses public keys. That's why they all come out the same. And so um, in the event that a different address was generated, we can make some assumptions that like um, a key has been replaced with someone's that we didn't right. suspect or something something's like wrong at that level, right? Like it's not right. uh, it's yeah, not like using it. the keys that we expect it to have. Right. And that also means if they're not generating the same addresses, that means that if you're doing this kind of multi-signature thing that we're going to do, that it's not mm -hmm. going to work because they're basically mm -hmm. signing for different things. They're, yeah. signing, they're expecting to sign different things. So um, this means we're, this is a good checkpoint that we know where we created our descriptors right, at least to the point that they're all generating the same scripts. Nice. Those, those scripts turn into addresses. So, um, so then, yeah, that, that lets us go to the next step. Um, um, just quickly, I think we had a question. I don't know if we answered it. Um, yeah. You might have, I might have missed it. But um, what if we generate more than one address for any of them? A good question. It's a great question. Um, actually, do you want to want to try that? Connor? Okay. Um, so if I, I can guess I can just do Carol since we're already here. So basically, just try and generate a new address. I would say generate a new address for two two of them to see what happens. Okay. So. Oh, yeah or something get up arrow um, and uh okay carol and bob Oops. so you can see they generated a new address but a different one because they have uh, the same index a new, yeah a new address but different one still the same <laughs> right if, if, that that sense. Sense. <laughs> you look at this, if you looked at our if you go back and look at our descriptor you can see there was a star at the end it always starts at zero that star that would be what you would call the index the index of the um the wallet index basically the address so, the, so this address will be at like index the next index zero and then the, this following address that we just generated is at one and right. so on and so forth right so that's, yeah. that's that's some of the information that's kept in the kind of cached data is what right. keeps track of what's the last index that it created an address for, and then it always goes and gives you the next one because you never want to reuse addresses, so you always want to generate something you haven't generated before. Got you. 
Um, another question, how does the new address command handle derivation path, just incrementing it every time? Is there a way to retrieve a specific address again? So good question. Um, that's come up before actually in the library. Uh, the CLI only lets you get a new address, but the, the BDK software library does allow you to jump around and give it specific indexes if you wanted to. It has a whole set of different ways to do that. You can either get the next index, you can reset the index to a different spot. Um, you can give it a, um, just give it like peek at some random index, uh, some random address without changing the index. So it's got a variable, a, a variety of different ways to do that. If you go to the docs on the web page and you look at the library documentation, you can see all the different conditions. It's pretty well documented there. Um, okay, nice. Great addresses. Yeah. Um, but the CLI doesn't offer all those options, but that's, you know, maybe someday we'll okay, add. Okay. So we, yeah. So we have some uh, address. Yeah. So now, can you still hear me? I think Connor might have. Two might have blocks. Oh, am I still with you? Yeah. Sorry. I think I, I okay. lost you for a second, but okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah. No worries. Okay. Um, so yeah, we can we can go to the next stage now. Yeah. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to sync our wallets. This is really important, especially for something like this. Um, so sync. Before you do anything, you're gonna you need to sync your wallet to the blockchain. So what it's gonna do is mm -hmm. it's basically looking, it's searching the blockchain to see if you've if any of your addresses have been used and if they have been used, if there's any transactions against them. In this case, we should come up with zero transactions because we just created these wallets randomly um, today. So, but we still like to. It's still a good idea to sync first. Um, I have three commands for each of the wallets: the sync, get balance, and then list transactions. Um, um okay so um so we can sync alice's wallet is it similar yes yeah. similar no, syntax to the same, yeah. Look the yeah. Same. okay so and the alice yeah. at this point also we don't need to do you can just do a sync and then you can do a get balance we don't need to show the transactions because there won't be any yep, just sync so sync. Yeah, that means it succeeded you'll get an error message if it had trouble connecting to the the and then if if I if I want to get the balance, I do. Yeah, I think you can um, just do that arrow maybe if you don't want to type it. Okay. And then and then, I was in it. It just it literally get balance here. Yeah, just a get under a get underscore balance. Sorry. Balance. Oops, I can't spell balance. Uh... There we go. Arrow Satoshi's. Okay. Awesome. Um... Yep, do, so, we wanna, do we want to, do we want to, I guess I would, uh, the yeah, I guess interesting. Really, uh, yeah, I was going to say, do we want to go to, did we want to go to a faucet and send some funds in, but it, we will do that. Yeah. We'll do that next. Yeah, okay, time. No, okay. Sync all of them. At least you, we don't have to okay. show the balance, but we can sync. I, I, maybe it's worth showing the balance for, at least for Bob, because what's this, okay. since we're looking just, just, just like we got the addresses coming up the same, the balance mm -hmm. always be the same too. Even though, like, even though we're we're showing this on one computer, if we were running this on three computers on three different continents, you mm -hmm. would get the same results here. You'd get the same addresses, and you would get the same um, balance and the same list of transactions. Assuming you were talking to a, uh, you know, a non-cheating Bitcoin Electrum server. Okay. Uh, ideally. Uh, so, okay, so I missed that one as well. So we have um, a list transactions command, and that should return nothing because we haven't done any transactions yet. Yeah. And then. Yeah. The, the last one as well would be to sync Carol's wallet. Mm -hmm. um, so, so okay, so the sync is uh, it's using an Electrum server under the hood to just uh, grab, yes, um, grab blockchain information using what? What does it? Does it just use uh, block headers or how does it? So, well, basically, the Electrum server has a index. It, it as blocks come in, it indexes every address. So it's just a simple kind of an API call, and it just it already has them sort of pre-indexed in a database. Right. Uh, if you use a different blockchain besides Electrum, it will work a little differently. For instance, if you use compact block filters, mm -hmm. more of the work is happening in BDK. It's it's doing more of talking to other random. Well, currently we only support connecting to a single node. Um, but it would connect to that single node and it would, then it would go through kind of what you were saying, would download all the okay. headers and all that stuff. Okay. So this is okay. Now. 
All right, cool. So we've just basically, yeah, uh, we've synced Alice's wallet. We've checked her balance. Um, we didn't list her transactions, but we've done the same for Bob and uh, Carol. So we've synced their wallet using Electrum server, checked the balance and list their transactions. And everything's coming back as um, empty at the moment because we've not done any transactions. So, right. so now what we, what we can do now is, um, let's see where we were. Um, so we can go ahead and get a new address or we can use okay. one of the ones up on your, if you want to go grab one of the ones up on your, um, uh, so I cleared the screen. So we might have to just grab a new one. It's fine. You can grab yeah. it from any of, any of the three, it doesn't matter which one. Uh, just one second. So, uh, we've got another question. So Electrum Neutrino Bitcoin RPC, are there any other ways BDK could source blockchain data? So we have one other one that I didn't mention, which was Esplora. Esplora is basically just a uh, a different interface on an Electrum server. It's more of a REST-based instead of a socket-based protocol. Um, mm -hmm. And let me think, am I missing anything else? Yeah, those are the those are the yeah Electrum, Esplora, Neutrino, a, a limited subset of Neutrino. We haven't fully fleshed out all of the features of Neutrino. Like mm -hmm. I said, currently we only connect to a single node. And then RPC, yeah. Okay. Um, all right, cool. So I'm going to grab an address from Alice. Okay. Um, cool. So do I, I guess yeah, I need to just yeah, store just that somewhere. That. And then you can yeah. go to a block explorer. I think I put a link in the notes. One. Uh, two, let's see. Block explorer. Uh, Could I use? Uh, use anyone. I put faucet.uo1net. Okay, one second. Um, I'm gonna have to swap over to the browser quickly. Oh, I don't actually need to do that. What am I doing? Let me, because I'm sharing my screen, not my window. So I think I can do this and do that. Okay. And then um, if I go back to terminal and paste in her address, uh, yeah, just I know this is no when when yeah, paste the address. you paste oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. I got you. And then I, I usually maybe change the number, make it like one, two, three, or something, just so we know it's uh, it's the one, uh, yeah, yep, okay, and then send that. Send all right, so okay, so sorry, I thought we were going to block explorer to check. So oh, yeah, was, okay, so we're yeah. actually sending, te we're actually sending yeah. testnet clients to this address now, yeah, exactly, exactly, okay. Um, and it says zero the one coin sent to okay, so I guess now we could go to a blocking, yeah. We could check it now. And worry about that. Um, so we want test net, right? And then we paste in the address and let's see, okay. Whoa, um. You can see that that actually. Did you hear the little sound? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it always surprises me when that happens. All right, so it, it did broadcast the transaction. Okay. Um, the block on testnet seems to be going pretty fast today, so we might have. Yeah. To, okay. So total. We'll see if it it'll still work. Um, okay. So now, uh, do we want to sync? Yes. Exactly. So okay. now you want to verify you got your deposit. You can use Alice, Bob, or Carol, or or multiple of them. To do another sync and balance, and you'll see. Is it just sync, was it? Mm -hmm. Yep, just sync. And then get. Okay, here we go. Um, is there a way to for us to know if it's like confirmed yet in the CLI? Yeah. So if you do list transactions, you'll see that's a that's a good thing to do. Okay, okay, we've got a bit more info here. So we've got confirmation time, uh, the height of the block it was in, timestamp, what fee we paid, how much we received, whether or not we sent anything, transaction, no, not quite sure what that means, but a transaction ID and verified false, I'm assuming that just means it's not been confirmed. Well, actually, no. So it should be confirmed here because it's a uh, two one eight eight three is the block height that it was confirmed. Um, okay. 
I'm not exactly sure what the no means here. <laughs> I'd have to go look it up. Okay. Is verified not um does it not wait for like maybe six blocks or um I think I think the reason here is there's a feature to enable verification. And if we don't enable uh, that feature, it doesn't do it basically does a basic sanity check that you right, follow all the, the rules. Um I'd have to check to, I think that's a, it's either turned off or something we have to um, enable somewhere. Okay. But anyway, you can see that the one, two, three, the hundred and twenty-three, uh, twelve thousand three hundred mm -hmm. were received. And if you check any of the other address, any of the other wallets, you'll see that they also have the same balance. If you do it, uh, let's see. If I do Carol, uh, and do you have balance? Oh yeah. Oh no, I have to sync. I've got to do a sync yeah. first, haven't I? Yeah. yeah. And that's a good. That's a good test, actually, because yeah. If you don't sync, you're not going to get that latest transaction. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There cool. you go. And maybe we just do Bob for a sanity check as well. Yeah. Um, and actually, this is if you're doing this kind of testing, you do have to have a like. If we were gonna eventually, we're gonna have to get Bob to do a signature. He has to be synced up before he can do that signature too, because he needs some of right. the data. He needs to know about the data that's feeding the transaction we're gonna create. Um. Do list transaction for Bob. Okay. All right. uh, I'm with you. That makes sense. Okay. So now we get to the fun part. Um, we're actually going to spend some of this, these funds. We're actually going to spend all of them. Okay. Um, and the way we're going to do that is we're going to, um, well, actually, I'm sorry. Before we do that, I'm going to do one other little fancy thing here. So we're going to mm -hmm. do this and uh, BDK CLI wallet and then dash W Alice um, and then dash D her descriptor. And then yeah, policies that one. Policies. Okay. What what's uh, well, what does this do then? What this is going to do is it's going to spit out in sort of a machine readable way mm -hmm. uh, the policies that can sign that that can spend from this wallet. And mm -hmm. the only thing we really need to notice here is there's this ID. We're going to have to copy this ID. This UAD XWVHP. So mm -hmm. go ahead and copy that into your. We're going to need that because that's um, going to change for every wallet. Um, and then if you just scroll down, you can see there's four little statements in here underneath that ID. Uh, and they represent, they represent all the different signatures of the people who can sign. So you can see there's this, um, right, that's the first one. Then there's two more after that. Each one of them has a, has basically, it's what this policy statement is saying is these are the people who can produce signatures. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if you go to the bottom underneath the third one, you'll see one other thing. Um, you'll see that. Oh, okay, here we go. This is a, time, a relative right. time lock of value mm -hmm. two. So these are, there's basically four things in this list. A zero, one, and two are signature thing, are signature satisfactions for this policy. And then mm -hmm. um, number three, um, starting from zero, is, mm -hmm. is this time lock. So the reason this is important is when we're going to, spend a transaction, we actually have to tell BDK sort of which path we're going to use. Are we going to try to sign with just our signatures or mm -hmm. try to use signatures plus the time lock, which is why oh, yeah. I grabbed that little ID because we're going to have to specify that in our spending condition. Um, and if you look at okay. the next and where, where we do an export unsigned PSBT, you'll see okay. where one, that one, one, one second. So the, um, so this type, uh, so we have a type of signature and we have a type relative time lock. Um, mm -hmm. What what other, can you create like custom types for, for this no, as well? No, it's pretty limited. So you can do okay. a relative time lock. You can also do an absolute time lock. Okay. Um, and then you can do various kinds of thresholds. Like it could be, you know, okay. of threes, four of four. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You can also do like, you know, how lightning, Lightning does something called a, um, a hash pre-image where okay. you basically say, if you know a secret, mm -hmm. then like you could make one of these conditions instead of a time lock or instead of a signal, mm -hmm. you could say it's a hash time lock, uh, a hash um, pre-image. Mm. Sort of like saying, if you know the password and you give it to me, I'll unlock it. So there are okay. some, there are some things like that. Um, okay. That makes sense. You don't have like unlimited latitude <laughs> in terms okay. of it. Tell it to do, and then there's of course you can also do things like ands and ors, and you know if you can think of some scenarios where you might want to do that. I, I haven't, okay. yeah. So it, it, and this final, this final uh, 
block here, I guess, summarizes everything kind of above it almost. So like it says, yeah. you need M of N, you need three or four signatures. Um, three or four spending conditions, because one of them could be a time lock. Three or four spending conditions. Okay, okay. Or like, like I said, this instead of a time lock, it could be, uh, you know, this like pre-image thing. But anyway, yes, you're, yeah, okay. this, this sort of summarizes the top level. It's a threshold thing. You need three out of these things to, okay. do, to do it, to do the spending out of the wallet. Type fresh. Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right. So then if you want to grab that next unsigned PSBT command. Yeah. Um, and then we'll, one. after you put it in there, we can um, kind of analyze what we're doing in it. Okay. Um, okay, so we've got um, export unsigned PSBT. That's a, uh, what's, a P, what's a PSBT? Okay, good question. So, so it's a partially signed Bitcoin transaction. And what it is, is it's all the information needed to create a transaction, um, but it's missing signatures. Um, so it's got the output script and it's got uh, I, I believe it also has like the public keys of the people who can spend, but that doesn't have their actual signatures. So, um, right. so the result of running this com command would be a, a partially signed serialized transaction that we can use to pass around to our different um, people in this setup, Alice, Bob, mm -hmm. Carol, um, and they can like modify this trans or or they can add to this transaction to satisfy the ability to spend does that make sense right. about you can basically that? i mean they what they can do is they can add their signatures to it yeah so they can look at it this sort of two things i guess they can look at it they can examine it they can see mm -hmm. where the transaction is spending to um who the other people are that can add signatures what the others they can basically see these other spending conditions um right and, and then so what happens if someone got a hold of like a partially signed Bitcoin transaction mm -hmm. that and they didn't have and they were not part of like they didn't have the keys to that were that was sufficient to to spend and stuff like that? What 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 could happen then? Well, so you would lose a little bit of privacy. Basically, if somebody knew it was your PSBT, they would know mm -hmm. you control that address that you're spending from. But they can get what else, and there's no way they can do anything with it. Like they can't sign it. They can't. I mean, if they don't, if they're not part of your signing setup, mm -hmm. then there's really nothing they can do with it, especially if it's not signed at all. If it was fully signed, they could broadcast it on the network, but they couldn't change it. They could only just create a transaction out of it and 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 broadcast it out. So, so there's a question here. Um, once a PSPT is signed by all parties. Is it still referred to as a, yes. Um, <laughs> yes, that, it is still referred to as a PSBT. <laughs> um, I think the little linguistic uh, trick they made in the, the way this is described is you can have a PSBT that is finalized, which means it's, it's ready to be spent. Uh, it's ready to be broadcast onto the network. So we'll get our last step is you're mm -hmm. going to see we've created a finalized PSBT. And at that point, we're able to make a transaction out of it. And then that transaction is what we broadcast. So, Got you. okay. Um, so, can, can can you walk me through like just one this uh, um, creation of a PSBT? So, I'll I'll try and maybe go through it a little bit. So, yeah, we're using our BDK CLI wallet command with Alice's wallet using her descriptor, mm -hmm. and we have this create TX create transaction command mm -hmm. with this dash A. Yeah, sure. we'll do dash a. I probably shouldn't have used the abbreviated version, but dash A means spend all. So what we're spend doing is all, okay. everything in the wallet and it's spending it. And then two, and then an address. Uh, is this like a going back to the faucet, is it? So that's the address back to the faucet. That's where yeah. we're going to send it back. And then uh, yeah, you see the colon zero at the end. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the reason it's zero is because this is a very sort of niche case, which is if you say spend all, you don't give it an amount. You just put zero there. If we right. were if we weren't spending all, if we were just spending, you know, a thousand Satoshis, mm -hmm. we put dash A and instead of zero, you'd put a thousand or however much you were spending. Got you. Okay. That makes sense. And then external policy, dash dash external policy. Right. 
so it, so this is the this is the sort of the magic bit that you actually have to paste something in that I forgot to tell you to paste in. So um, remember that policy ID we pulled out of the. Oh yeah, I've got that. Uh, where is so it? that's where we where it says FYR. There we need to substitute in your policy. Actually, I'll update it on the. Let's if, see if you put, put it there. So okay, so I need to put it here. I think. Um, second. Okay. Um, so I want to put it in place of this. So, and this was the ID from the spending, uh, from the spending policy right. key, wasn't it? it? it yeah. It was the. Uh, I think I don't know. If, yeah, that that that's right. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the, that's basically telling us. So we only had like kind of one policy. There could be multiple. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, in this case, we just had one. But the important part here is see it says zero one two. That means zero, one, okay. condition zero one and two, which were those three signatures. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this oh so this represents like the whole policy, mm -hmm. and but within that there could be like multiple, and then to reference them you just pick the unique ID for each yeah. kind of policy. Right, I got you. So it's a, it's a little cryptic looking, but that's yeah, okay. the thing. And you could imagine probably if you were a nice UI designer, you could find a much yeah. better way to do it. But yeah, um, okay. but yeah so that that's the thing. And, and the reason is because otherwise the wallet doesn't know, am I trying to use three signatures or am I trying to use two signatures plus a timeline? Right. And this is kind of just clarifying that ambiguity for them. Okay, that makes sense to me. Um, and then let me see what else we got here. Okay, so then I think that's it. And then we're just using JQ to get the PSBT out. Okay. Right. That makes sense to me. And then if we echo yeah, we echo unsigned it. PSBT, we get this ugly looking alphanumeric string. Right. So that is that is in um base sixty four, I believe the encoding is called. And okay. it's um yeah, it's not pretty to look at. But you can use this and put it in a QR code or send it across a, you know, a USB cable or something. So we could have used um, any of the spenders to create this PSBT. It could have been Alice, Bob, or Carol. Exactly. That could have created this PSBT. Okay. And you sure. will get the same. You should. You know. You will get the same PSBT. Got you. So that's correct. And yeah. So anybody can initiate it by creating the initial unsigned one. Now mm -hmm. we'll. Now that we have this unsigned variable, um, we can pass it to our other our other signers in this case. Now, mm -hmm. you take maybe you want to edit that little um, that little uh, cheat sheet we're working off of, and just okay. put that, that new signing policy ID in there. Oh yeah, uh, this is have to uh, and take the other ones. Yeah, that will save me a bit of a headache. Actually. If you just want to do the first one. I'll go do the rest. Um. So, uh, da, 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 da. is this where we're? Oh, okay, here. Okay, yeah, I got you. Um, oh, although I can't edit because I don't, I don't have access no, to it. Oh, shoot, sorry. I'll, I'll paste it in our little chat here. Hold on. Okay. You can change it for me. Um, while you do that, um, let me see what's going on in the chat. Okay, so. <laughs> How's it going, Fode? Fode still say Fode saying, is it still a PSBT question mark? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know at that point. Once you have satisfied all of the conditions, maybe it's uh, not partially signed anymore, but semantics, there you go. Um, what else? More about, okay, so there was some stuff about Explorer as well. I think I missed that, but good looking at Steven. Um, okay. <laughs> We can go ahead and start signing now. I, I yeah, I, yeah, I just realized too that we only really needed that um, that's uh, policy ID, ID for creating it. Because once we've created it, uh, of course, yeah. everything up you need, you've actually create you've put in that PSBT the transaction that everybody else needs to sign. So Got all you, you need to give them is this PSBT. So you you can see the next command is where. So okay, so yeah, if we was to do that again, oh, I see. So if, even if we was to do that again using the same policy ID, but with Bob, it's still gonna um, give us this same base sixty-four yeah. representation of the PSBT anyway. So yeah, okay. 
So since you've already got it in the you've already got it in the um, the variable, we can just go to the next command, which is yeah. create a an Alice signed PSVT. Um, okay. And if you want to paste that in, we can go through kind of analyzing what it means. So it, let me do that again. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, you want to go through it? You can see. Okay, so we've got Alice Alice signed PSBT. So we're using the BDK CLI again, wallet, using that wallet named Alice, using her descriptor, using the sign command, PSBT flag, and assigning that to um, the Alice signed PSBT variable. Okay, so I guess this will return... A, a new PSBT, well, not a new PS, a modified PSBT yeah. with her signature. Right. right. So this is going to, yeah, this is going to basically add. So Alice created an unsigned version. This is going to add a signature from Alice to that PSBT. Mm -hmm. Okay. So do that. Okay. And then the other, now basically, we just have to repeat that command for Bob and for Carol. Yeah. And just as a reminder, the reason they're able to sign is because they have a private key in their descriptors, mm -hmm. which is their. Um, what they use okay. as their private key. Okay, so now we've got it stored in a variable. Alice, Bob have now right. signed. And then this last one is going to be yeah. the final one, which includes includes Carol's signature. Yes, exactly. Um, and then I think I put a little command, so because I kind of hid some of this. But if you do, mm -hmm. you can go ahead and run the Carol command again without that export. Um, the Carol command again without the export. So it's, yeah, pulling out the, um, so let's see. Oh, uh, so this one, actually, I guess you can take, you um, can, yeah. So what I'm doing here is I'm just, um, oh no, sorry, not that one. Um, okay. it, it's, um, it's the one that says is finalized at the end. Uh, let's see here. Oh, okay. I got you. Yeah, I did in twice. So, one of them. It's confusing. Yeah, I got you. Uh, oh, how do I be clear without doing what I'm doing right now? <laughs> um, okay, let's see. So, yeah. So what? Okay. I'm so what have we got here? Yeah. Yeah. So here, instead of pulling out. Um, Instead of pulling out the PSBT, I'm pulling out one of there's a variable that gets spit out. Actually, I guess you could just get rid of that whole JQ thing if you just want to see the raw result. Um, uh, so get rid of this last. Uh... Yeah, just that last up to the bar right there. Yeah, go ahead and just do that. It's probably more. So you can see okay, yeah. this the PSBT plus this thing that says finalized. Oh, uh, right. And so I'm assuming it's finalized would be false if we had, let's just say, only two signatures. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, yes, exactly. If it was, yeah, missing those. Mm -hmm. So. Um, okay, uh, we've got some stuff going on in the chat. Yeah, so let's, catch, <laughs> let's catch up a little bit. So if you, uh, da, 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 there are tools you can, you, okay, there oh. are tools you can use to visualize what's in your PSVD, don't do that with real funds. Uh, okay, so example is bip174.org. Cool. If if you put the PSBT in there, you should see one of the signatures is applied and others are missing. Um, how do you guys build the WASM piece of BDK? I've got That's a bit of a body. Yeah, yeah, that, was, <laughs> that, that one. Maybe, maybe if we've got a bit of time at the end, we can maybe adjust some of that language binding stuff. Um, what else have we got? Want to become famous by followers. So we've got, oh God, we've got some uh, trolls as well. That means we're doing good things. Um, <laughs> the finalizing of a PSBT is the process of turning it into a fully signed transaction that can be broadcast. Yep. Well, well summed up. And that's our next okay. step here. So now we'll pull up on the chat. A finalized PSBT. Mm -hmm. And um, what we don't have is we don't have. Um, what did I? Wait, I might have did something wrong here. Right. Sorry. Um, okay. I think I, I, I skipped a command. I'm going to just grab it out of our log here. 
Because what we yeah, have no to now is we have to um, broadcast one. Um, oh, okay, okay, got you. So I just uh, I'm going to modify this last one here. So instead of signing, we're going to broadcast. So if you look at the little the note there, uh, yeah. I'm going to just broadcast it from Carol. She was the last one to sign it, which is typically okay. the case. And actually, oops, sorry, I got rid of this part too. Okay. Uh, so we can get rid of this last bit so we can see it actually print the console. Okay. Um, okay so uh, we're going to broadcast it from Carol because she just because she was the last signer and then so the Alice Bob signed PSBT is oh, actually the, uh, that's that's probably not, one. Yep, yeah. right. that's the wrong one. It's yeah. the final PSBT is the one we need. Ah, uh, yeah. So I'll just type it in here. So it's actually just from SBT. I think your Discord might be uh, popping off, Steve, getting a few uh, notifications in the background. From what? Uh, from your Discord. <laughs> oh, you can see those? Yeah, this, no, no, we can't see them, but we can hear the notifications. I, I can anyway. I don't know if anyone else can. Um, might might want to mute, mute if you can. It's not too much drama, but... Yeah, it's all right. Yeah. No, it's okay. Um, Okay. Yep. Um, so, okay. So you got it there. Um, and we just hit hit go. Yeah. Try and broadcast mm -hmm. it and see what happens. Okay, that worked. So we got a TX ID transaction ID. Should we go and actually see if we uh if it broadcasted? So we can try mempool dot space again, I guess. Um, and see check out test net and paste in the transaction ID. And first seen just now, fee, okay, yeah, and the amount. <laughs> the blocks are moving. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, forever, it's, got, it's got one confirmation already on <clears throat> to test net. Things are moving fast on test net. No, yeah, two confirmations, so. Um, and we spent all of the funds because, um, yeah, I remember us doing the one, two, three. Yeah. Thing. And then there's so, some fee. And, and in BDK, I we didn't talk about this, but you can adjust the fee. Um, you give it as a value of um, Satoshi's per virtual byte. Mm -hmm. I forget what it defaults to. It defaults to something like probably the lowest one or something. But um, mm -hmm. anyway, that, there's a lot of different knobs we didn't talk about in terms of things you can adjust on the transaction. Mm -hmm. um, and then the so, lot, I guess. Um, so to... now I guess uh, on time. What's our? Do we have a? Do we have time for yeah. the next uh, next bit um let's see so just just one last thing i've seen here as well is that um just to check that the funds have uh yeah left the wallet we can do another yeah. sync so yeah. we can yeah. sync alice's and then oh oh come on that the start here which i don't need i think <laughs> um so we'll sync alice's wallet again and then i guess do a get balance and then we see it's back oh. to zero now. Oh yeah, back to zero, right? That's correct. Yeah. Okay, I, cool. Do you do, uh, show transactions, I think. Uh, list transactions. Yeah, list transactions. Yeah. yeah. Transactions. Okay, okay, so now we have two now. So um, it's showing you the ones that were. Bent. So you can see there's the sent and received. So here it says we received one, two, three, and then mm -hmm. we sent one, two, three. And yeah, then, yeah. So you can see all that. Got you. Uh, okay, this, fantastic. Yeah. Not really, you know, meant for users. It's kind of yeah. All the all right. The gory details. That's fantastic. So yeah, um, let's just quickly see what's going on in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, more fire. Sixty-five thousand sats for the for the um limited edition advancing bitcoin hoodie um <laughs> 90 000 sats for the limited edition advancing bit 100k sats for the bitcoin oh. limited edition hoodie although that is um a bid from the team itself and the bitcoin developers team like i don't know if that's a valid uh bid but um in the numbers there <laughs> <laughs> yeah Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, um, all right. So we, we, yeah, we do have eight minutes left. I, I, I think we maybe stop here and maybe yeah. just spend the next like um, eight or so minutes answering questions if people have any. But before we do that, um, what, what, what would have been 
like the some of the next steps we could have we could yeah. have took so, so the next step would look very much like what we just did in terms of making a transaction the only difference is instead of doing a uh, when we set that policy the signing policy we did zero one and two which meant we were using three the three signatures um we were going to do it again but we we're going to use zero one and three which means we were going to skip mm -hmm. Carol's signature um and what that would do is everything else would look identical except you would see that it it didn't need three signatures this time it just needed the two um but if we broadcast it super quick before it got mm -hmm. confirmed before the mm -hmm. uh, uh the prior uh, the prior input got confirmed mm -hmm. so if we did a quick then it would it would fail until right. those two blocks so basically you have to age your input coin or partial coin. yeah have to age that two blocks before to let you spend it. So okay. you could imagine there could be some, somebody could, you know, maybe have a, you know, a family member that's unreliable and like, well, if, you know, if, yeah. you know, she doesn't sign in a, in a couple hours, then it'll just, yeah. two of the, two of them sign it or something like that. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Well, that can be um, the viewer's homework then um, to, right. to go ahead and uh, see if they can use that additional spending policy um in replacement of requiring uh the third signature mm -hmm. and um yeah let us let us know how you find it and let us know how you get on with that uh, there's a blog there's a supporting blog post um as well um and uh funder biscuit has done a, a really nice uh, short video series on the cli as well um, which will also post in the description so feel free to um go, go ahead and do that as well so we've got uh, about five minutes left, so we can um, answer some other questions. I know there was one earlier from Fode around uh, language bindings and WASM. Um, I know that's a whole <laughs> that's a whole rabbit hole in and of itself, but may maybe Steve, you can speak to s some of that. Um, yeah. So, um, so our our current support for um, um, for WASM, which is for people who aren't familiar with WASM, it's basically a way of running. You can compile a Rust program like BDK into a binary format that can be executed within a web browser or within a JavaScript engine. Um, so that's WASM, um, and we do support WASM. You can't you can compile BDK and run it in a in a browser. If you go to the Bitcoin um, the Bitcoin Dev Kit .org website, you'll see an example of BDK running as a WASM app. Um, my only hesitation is it's not super used or supported right now. So it's something that we would, you know, if, if, if somebody's really serious about using, making a WASM app out of BDK, um, we should talk and figure out exactly which pieces you need and make sure those are supported currently. Um, mm -hmm. Also, we're in the middle right now of doing some sort of re-architecting the APIs to make it, and once that refactoring has been done, it should actually make it easier to use in WASM because it's going to be, we're basically um, sort of separating the major pieces. Um, uh, that's something that um, Lloyd Poyer is doing. And it's related also to the stuff that, um, that will make it easier for us to integrate with LDK. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that will also make things like WASM uh, easier because there'll be less dependencies. And the um, that that's one of the, the hiccups you kind of get sometimes with WASM is it doesn't support everything that a normal operating system does. Okay. So hopefully that answers it. What uh, Fody, <laughs> come chat with me later if you want to chat <laughs> about what you're working on. Wonderful. Um, cool. Any any other questions uh, from from the chat here? Um, just scrolling through to see if we've missed anything. I think we're definitely caught up um we do apparently need some um auction functionality mm -hmm. in bdk native support for auctions would be good apparently i think if we do, <laughs> I suggest there if we do any um uh, if we do any uh like um hackathons i think there's a good suggestion there if someone wants to make mm -hmm. a, uh, some sort of uh, auction system with uh, bdk that would be awesome um so are you following progress on ldk and thinking how it will integrate with bdk yeah, so actually, um, we have um, someone right now who is is, is working on that. Um, um, I'm just gonna, it's uh, Cantrell. Uh, I forgot John, the John 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 Cantrell. Yes. So John yeah. Cantrell is his is his handle, and mm -hmm. he's working on integrating. He's got a, a project that his repository has a, a kind of a combined project working right mm -hmm. now. Um, mm -hmm. And say. 
um, the basics, it's basic open source. And um, so he has a working implementation of BDK and LDK working together, but we are, there's additional things we are working on to make that integration more seamless and kind of uh, better, better integrated. So mm -hmm. it's, but there is some working working project right now with Sensei, so check that out and then you know Fantastic, yeah. keep watching for new new developments in that area. Yeah, is it possible select uh, select to select functionality from BDK to build the binaries? Yeah, so if you're doing it in the Rust, you know, at the very beginning of the stream, we um, Connor did dash dash features. And then he gave it some different features. Well, you can do the same thing for the core library in Rust. You can say, you know, add or remove different functions, a different mm -hmm. like modules. I mean, one example, for instance, is somebody, um, um, a, a, a developer named Ul Richard, created mm -hmm. a functionality to create um, proof of reserves. It's not part of the core BDK, but it's a feature you can add when you're building your binary to include. Um, mm -hmm. It's not, not part of the default build though, so. Um, the only things that are part of the default build are very minimal. Like it's not even the, the default doesn't even have the online features. Um, you have to add Electrum or whatever you want. So yeah, it's already does the default build. Does the default build include no STD as well? Um, so that that is something we're not really able to do right now. The no, oh, the no okay. build, for those who aren't familiar with it, it is basically running it on a non-operating system, something like a mm. embedded system, like a yeah. you know piece of hardware that doesn't mm -hmm. have an operating system. Um, and that is a goal we have, we'd like to get to, but we're not there yet. So it's okay, cool. on the, on the kind of visual yeah. we'd like to get to. Okay. As more and more people need use Bitcoin across a wide range of environments, a lot of software will need to manage wallets, their own wallets, even thought, even though they're not Bitcoin wallets themselves, BDK is also for those use cases. Sick. Um, uh, Fode's, please add your projects here. So Fode's got um, the Bitcoin Developers Academy okay. as well. So if you okay. have a awesome Rust Bitcoin project, uh, head over to that GitHub repo and add it there so we can uh, keep a nice, um, I guess, uh, collection of, of these projects. Uh, thanks, Steve and Connor. No worries. All good. Um, uh, is this a, is this a troller again, or is this going to be? Does any? <laughs> um, I don't know if it's if from cryptonomic news even serious. Uh, yeah. Question. Oh. yeah. So John Cantrell is a is a name from a book. <laughs> I okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. I thought I thought, <laughs> I thought you were John. Sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. That's funny. Um, all right, cool. So we've hit the hour mark anyway, and it's, it's time to, to wrap up. But I want to thank you, Steve, for, for taking us through um, Thanks, the CLI stuff today. Just thank you for your work in general that you're doing in Bitcoin, like um, the stuff that the, and the contributors to BDK and the work they're doing there is fantastic. Like me personally, I think it's going to be like an awesome year for onboarding new projects to, to the BDK, making it super easy for developers to to build on bitcoin like i've had conversations over the last couple of yeah. days where people have um you know made significant projects in a few days or at least had 90 percent of their projects completed um in a few days by using bdk and modifying bdk um so yeah it's definitely a project to keep a close eye on and to learn about and uh, hopefully these these streams allow you to do that and uh give you the impetus and the enthusiasm to want to dive further down the rabbit hole so um thanks for everyone for tuning in and we'll see you soon yep thanks connor it's a lot of fun see you peace